I'm 91 years old, and uh, I went to, I'm an old farm boy, and uh, that had some good points. Because when I went through the cadet program, the farm boys became pilots, and the city people became bombardiers and navigators. And so uh, I was blessed. But I, the thing is, I graduated from Lincolnville High School, which is between Marion and Harrington. And uh, it was a very small school. Was for, I was 14 in my class. And uh, I, was, uh, I had the best grades in my, of 14 when I was a senior. And, uh, and uh, the superintendent thought was, they were too low, so they made me a cold salutatorian with uh, another student. So, so uh, <coughs> I, I enjoyed farming, and, uh, but they were poor. And I, I uh, lived two and a fourth miles from a one-room schoolhouse, and so I had to walk to school two and a fourth miles every day. Uh, in the first grade. Then my brothers, uh, my brother, uh, they went to high school and so my dad bought a uh, horse and buggy and and we lived six miles from Lincolnville and for three years I rode that horse and buggy to, to, uh, in, a, in the horse and buggy on, uh, to, to class. Then uh, finally my dad could afford a, a 1924 Dodge vehicle, and, and it, it was a monster. <laughs> it was big. But anyway, we finally got Model T Fords, and then we got Model A's. And by the time I was a senior in high school, I was driving a uh, Model A uh, Ford to, to school. I graduated in 1942, and uh, then I, uh, I decided that I wanted to be a, a civil engineer, and I was going to construct the Alaskan Highway all the way from Alaska to Argentina. That was my big goal. So I went to Emporia State, and uh, so t with this in mind. Well, I, I probably made a mistake, but maybe it was a good blessing. I went out for football. And, uh, and let's see, were, a lot of the kids were leaving college and going into the service, but I hadn't. So we, the football team went down to take the uh, Army Air Corps test. And, uh, and so uh, I, my brother says, and listen, I, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to get a four-year, uh, he, he's going to get a one-year deferment, and I'm going to get a four-year deferment to college, uh, so before going to the aviation cadet program. Well, so I signed up, and I just just turned 18, and, and my, my brother talked my parents into signing the, the waiver for enlistment. And so I, I did a semester at college uh, there in Emporia State. And then uh, I enrolled for the second semester, and then all at once, here comes a letter from the Army. I'm called to active duty on February 23, 1943. And, uh, and, my, and my brother with one year deferment, he was called three days earlier. So I, that, that's the space of what happened with that one year and four year deferment. And so I went to Kansas City and was sworn in. I went to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, which is outside of St. Louis. And uh, we were put in barracks with no stoves in. And this is in February now. And so we froze to death, but we had warm clothes. And I was there just one month for basic training, and I got sent to Carroll College in Waukesha, Wisconsin, for cadet college. 
And I got five months of cadet college. And then after that, they put me on a train, troop train, and I went to Santa Ana, California, and uh, for cadet classification and, and uh, ground crew training. And so, uh, and luck was headed. I was, I was rated uh, to become a pilot, and uh, my brother, who was also in the program, worst out because of eyesight. He had bad eyes, and so he didn't get to go with the pilot train. What's Cadet College? What do you do there? Well, it's just Army College. Okay. In other words, they had special instructions instru in five months. And, and they taught us geography and math and, and uh, these, uh, these courses that are related to flying. And uh, I was there about, about two and a half months, I mentioned, going through the different courses in the cadet program. And then they sent me to, uh, well, uh, I should say that I got 10 hours flying time at Waukesha, Wisconsin, but they wouldn't let us soul. We flew Piper Cubs. And, and so, but it helped getting the feel of the airplane. And then when I went to Santa Ana, they sent me on to, uh, to uh, Santa Maria, California to fly the PT-13s, which is, the PT-13 is a bi-wing plane and uh, it had a big engine on it. And, and so I, there it was run by a, private school, the Hancock College of Aeronautics. And while I was uh, there, I learned to fly, and I soloed. And, uh, but the, the, first, the first time I met the instructor, he took the front seat, and then uh, I took the rear seat. And uh, he could tell that I was scared. So what does he do? He makes, he does 22 slow rolls. 22! one after another, and, and my seat belt was loose. And I, every time you get on the bottom line, I could feel it, uh, it was holding me on, and I cut my hand holding on to the side of the airplane. But, uh, but anyway, I survived that. And then uh, they, we started training, and, uh, and so they learned to fly at least. The Stearman PT-13, which was made in Wichita, Kansas, and uh, and uh, and I had at the landing gear on the P-13 was real narrow, and crossroad landings were were hard to make at first, and I had problems. And then and the instructor told me he's going to wash me out if I couldn't get those crosswind landings right, but I did. And then I went to basic flying at Lemoore, California, and we flew what they call the Volte. Uh, we call them the vibrator because they were so loud and noisy and shook, you know. But anyway, it, I made a hit. It made a, the plane made a hit with me, and I became a very good pilot with the with the Volte vibrator. And then I about halfway through. The uh, training there, they uh, they said we are making a special class out of you, and uh, you're going to fly twin engine aircraft in the second half of basic training. And you should fly the one plane through basic training, which is about two about three, three months. And so I learned. They, I, I went into the twin engine Cessna Bobcat, which was a canvas airplane with, made out of wood, but it, it was a good instructing plane, and and uh, and that was also made in Wichita, Kansas. Well, uh, when when uh, so I, I finished flight training with the Cessna Bobcat, and then they said uh, you will go to Lamar, Colorado, to fly the B 25s and so I I was real enthused because we were being picked out to be specialists in B-25s 
and yet they were being flown in the South Pacific, and it was a very good airplane for for dive bombing and, and uh, other uh, bombings. And so uh, then there's a there's a general name of Doolittle. He came and bombed Tokyo. And so what happens? Fifty of us that were went to supposed to fly B twenty fives in the <laughs> fly B twenty fives in in uh, advance. Uh, they said a fifth of us are going to have to go and fly the same old airplane that Cessna the Bobcat in uh, in advance training. So I got sent to Marfa, Texas, and uh, and I, I did a, as mainly an instrument training course, and uh, and that, then I knew I was going to get my wings, you know, and, they, and so in. April 14th, 1944, I got my wings, and I got a month's leave uh, of a home at the hills of well, Lincolnville or Marion County, and, uh, and, and I had a, a, a traumatic experience when I went, when I went to Hillsboro on leave, here comes the POWs walking down the street with Hillsboro girls eating ice cream, arm in arm. And uh, it made me so mad. I think I, I was, you know, I was, I was getting real, real patriotic and I saw that. But, but I, I was going to call my commanding officer. But I was being transferred from Marfa, Texas to Roswell, New Mexico for B-17 flight training. And so I did not have a commander to call, commanding officer to call about this. So I, I finally cooled down and reported to Roswell, New Mexico, learning to fly the B-17. This is the B-17. This plane was made in 1935, first, first plane, 1935. And it had a, a real short tail right here, instead of being long and smooth, it was real short. Well, in 1935, uh, that was the best thing they had, but they had to make 100 modifications. It was over 100 modifications before it became flyable for combat. And they called this the Flying Fortress because there there was 10 machine guns on this airplane, and 50 caliber machine guns. It was a crew of 10 at this time. And, uh, and, and so uh, uh, that, that's uh, that what we started out with. Well, this plane, with its modifications, uh, went to Europe for the 8th Air Force. And, uh, it, it, what a beautiful wing it had, because it, it, this, it had so much lift to it. This plane would fly 288 mile an hour, but uh, for, for a mission and bombing, the, the speed was uh, 165 mile an hour. And, uh, and so, so it, it, but the thing is, we could shoot big shells through the, they could shoot big shells through our wings and through, through the plane and uh, he got hit, um, I was too bad, but he didn't get hit, the plane kept on flying. This plane had self-sealing gas tanks. Uh, and uh, what I mean by self-sealing gas tanks is when the gasoline hits, hits the, the three plies of lubber, uh, lo rubber, it swells up and plugs the holes. And in one mission, I, I got uh, 55 holes in my airplane. Seven direct bursts of in air aircraft under, under us. And the plane jumped seven times. And, uh, and in our, my ball gunner, he, the piece of shrapnel went right through the sight glass in the ball turret. And, he, and the flying glass cut his hands out, 
and cut off his oxygen hose. And so the, uh, the, the uh, gunner in the waist, he got him out of the ball turret and put an oxygen mask on him because we were at altitude now and, then, and we had to have oxygen. And so uh, we got him out and, and uh, he is the only member of my crew that was entitled to the Purple Heart because he had his hands all cut up with flying glass, you know, and went, because he went through, through his gloves. But when we came in to land, uh, the number four engine shook. Uh, when we got down about 800 RPMs, that number four engine just shook and it was shaking off the mountains. So we feathered it while we were on final approach at, at our air base. And so it, uh, it uh, we landed. And uh, everybody got out. The, the tail gunner missed the shrapnel. This is head three inches. And uh, the radio operator, he had 18 inches leeway from shrapnel. But, no, but it didn't bother the front part of the plane. But that was Hobson Airfield. And that's what we were hitting at that time. Well, Anyway, what I have to say about uh, the organization I was in, it was the most dedicated and the most patriotic organization I've known in my life. Ever total dedication. And all of us were very patriotic and and we were and and the thing is we really, really uh, appreciate it. Uh, the uh, Army Air Corps and, and the benefits it gives us. Now, when I went through flight training, I, as I said, I learned to fly B-17s in operation. They, t it, they told us that I got a million dollar flight instruction. A million dollar. In other words, that includes the cost of the air bases and the airplanes and everything else. But they got a million dollar education become a pilot. And I went to Roswell, New Mexico, and learned to fly the B-17. And, and so, uh, uh, I can remember flying a, a practice mission at Roswell, and it was June 6, and it says that they have invaded Normandy. I says, hooray, the war's going to be over with. I'll never have to go. And, uh, but it didn't turn out that way. But uh, then after I got my uh, learning to fly the B-17 uh, at Roswell, I was sent to Sioux City, Iowa, where I picked up my crew, crew of nine, of, uh, there was nine members in the crew. And uh, we were there for what we call operational training. And that's when they learned uh, to fly formation and learn in other words, get in a combat situation, learn what to do. Uh, my, my first close shave was there at Sioux City. It's because we had, on Thanksgiving Day, the, the, the powers that be at the air base says we're going to fly on Thanksgiving, formation on Thanksgiving Day. So we all taxied out, you know, on, on gripe like you wouldn't believe about that. And, uh, and so there's a practice when you fly in airplanes, you, you have uh, magnetos on them, you run up your engines before you take off. Well, and, and I ran up, when I ran up the engines there for takeoff at, on this Thanksgiving day, uh, the co-pilot says, see, the, look, there's fire. And that little hole, about two inches in diameter, in that number four engine. And uh, so we immediately called the fire department, and they, and they came out and they chopped holes in that in the cell where the where the where, where the fire was. And, but they did get it out finally. So they gave us another B-17, which is uh, 
old, uh, it was one of the first models of these, uh, and didn't have all the refinements on it. It also had brakes the half as much as the regular B-17 did. Well, anyway, they signed our crew that airplane, and we had to go up and join the formation and fly formation. Well, when you we come in for a landing, well, the brakes wouldn't hold, and we ran off the train in the runway. But uh, if if my co-pilot didn't see that fire, we would probably be all dead because that fire would have spread into the wing, into the tanks, and come off. And so we were blessed that way. So that's my first major uh, uh, problem that it was uh, didn't get to. Me. But after after uh, we went to Sioux City, why they shipped us overseas, and I didn't. We we would all look forward to flying a B-17, a new brand brand new 17 overseas. Well. 50 of us didn't get to go. We went by boat. We went on the Aquitania, which is a sister ship to Lusitania. And, and, and the only that too, we did not have an escort. And there are subs out there, German subs. But the thing is, the Aquitania would, would go cruise around, I think, 18 knots. And, it, and, and the, the German subs just weren't fast enough to catch us. And so, we had no problem going over there. Now, when I went, uh, so I was assigned to the 303rd Bob Group, and that was the uh, the three, 303rd Bob Group was one of the three Bob Groups, the first three Bob Groups in England for the Eighth Air Force, and they were known as Hell's Angels. I, I'm a Hell's Angel, and but and I flew the Hell's Angel airplane in training at Roswell. They never had, it, had any idea that's where I'd been going. So I uh, we went to, we, we docked at Liverpool and took a train to Molesworth, which is where the 303rd Bar Group is. And it, it was uh, a very dedicated uh, organization and they, hey, we had older pilots who were officers and, and uh, we were just kids, you know. They were they were officers, and I, I had a, a friend that I knew, uh, uh, Lieutenant St uh, Stivers, uh, who he was also there at the bomb group, and he says, "I'm going to my co-pilot is shooting uh, landings tonight," One, and. Uh, we don't have blackout here as we have brownouts. So you, you get a good idea. So the first night I was in the bomb group that I, I, I uh, <coughs> flew in this, uh, in the radio room. Uh, and, uh, and while this, uh, this uh, co pilot named a cactus, and he was Polish and from New York, and, I mean, not New York, but Chicago. And, uh, and, but he made a couple landings and everything went fine. But on the third landing, he hit the runway too hard and the wheel collapsed back. So, so one wheel was solid and one wheel was flapping like that in, in the air stand. And so uh, Stivers, he took off and flew and then he asked the operations officer what he should do. Now this is at night time now. And he says, well, you come in and make a one-wheel landing and uh, see and do it as best as you can, which he did. And, uh, of course, we were all, you know, uh, there was another guy beside myself was sandbagging on this mission just to get acquainted with the bomb group. Well, he came in and, and, uh, and so... He, the plane finally, you know, it when, when, when he had one wheel up and one wheel down, you know, that he, the plane was like that, you know, sitting on the side. But uh, we thought he, he had stopped. And so this other guy and I, we ran 
for the back door to get out of the plane in case it caught fire. Well, the, the, the uh, guy that in front of me, he stumbled over the ball turret going out and got run over him, you know. But the worst part is, is the plane was like this, and so I forgot, I, I, thought, I thought I'd put my foot on that ledge of that exit door and I missed it and I fell into a mud puddle. Would you imagine a mud puddle because it was an X at the X of the runways and then the mud puddle had developed because planes would taxi in there. So I, I fell flat in there in the mud puddle and then I stood up and they sprayed me with foam. <laughs> so so that was my first night with the bomb group. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, I, and the thing is, I, my, this bomb group was really a perfectionist, I mean, and we flew more missions. We flew more missions than any other uh, B-17 bomb group in England, uh, and uh, we just did more things. They, we lost more airplanes. We lost more more uh, crews. We dropped more bombs. We we held all the records, and they made 364 bomb runs, uh, missions uh, during the, the, the time they were there. Now, uh, my first ten missions. I flew the first. My first ten. Uh, I went through about uh, two weeks training. With the group, and then, uh, and then uh, they started missions on missions on February the 13th, of 1945. Uh, I flew my first mission, and I flew 10 missions in 13 days. And uh, the uh, thing is that the they we had you know, fighters that attacked our air base at night. Even though they was brown out, they, they, they come straight to the, ru the runways, but uh, we never, we slept through it because uh, we were too tired. Now, a mission would, would last about 10 hours. To fly a mission, you, you, you first get briefed at a briefing a, a hut, you know, and then you go and load the airplane. And the thing about it is, I got was assigned uh, a plane called My Darling, and it had 75 missions on, ready, ready to form 75 missions with the Eighth Air Force. And uh, and uh, another thing, they they had a practice of doing. If I wanted armor plate, a quarter inch steel armor plate, put under my seat, or on the side here. Or up in front of me, next morning it'd be there. So this, my darling, was uh, loaded with armor plate, and we had trouble keeping up with the formation because it, the plane just couldn't keep up. And so, it, it uh, we uh, that was an experience, uh, but. Uh, it's, where, where did you fly your missions at? Well, over Germany, all over Germany. And, okay, you see the, the, the uniform I would get him? When I, when I got there, we wore, we flew uh, officers' pinks and greens with, it, with, with the rake on it. So if we got shot down, we would be immediately taken to the war bomber, the German soldiers, you know. Because uh, if we if we uh, got shot down or, or we dropped bombs, they would come after us of baseball bats and pitchforks because they, they wouldn't have guns, but they they they'd beat you up if they could, and you can understand that. Uh, they're just you know. The war is hell, yeah. but the thing is, uh, ten, about 
of my missions were through the clouds. So I never really got to see where my bombs went, uh, except a couple times. Uh, I know one time that uh, uh, on the Berlin raid, our, we, or our bombs went away, we sure blew up a herd of cattle. The picture showed it. Uh, and, uh, and another time, we took off the tail end of a train pulling out of the Olsen, uh, city of Olsen. And uh, there's just a lot of things that uh, happen on missions. Well, when the Bombay doors came on, from on, uh, on the lead plane, everybody dropped their bombs when, because that the, the Bombay doors on that lead plane uh, malf uh, uh, didn't work correctly. And so that's the reason why uh, we dropped bombs. And then, then the, the, lead, the lead pilot, he didn't know that we dropped our bombs, so he says, we were going to make a 360. Well, we made a 360 degree turn, and, and we had no fighter cover, and we were just sitting, sitting ducks, just because so the colonel could, could drop his, his bombs. But that's, a, you just run into that. Now, <clears throat> I, after the 10th mission, uh, our crew went to lead crew. And uh, that means that we would, okay, this, is, this here is a typical um, a mission run, see? Uh, uh, this would be the lead pilot, and that would be the deputy lead. lead. The, in, on, on the airplane, that would be the only two airplanes that would have the Norton bomb sight in. And the rest of them dropped their bombs when, when the lead plane dropped its spot. Okay. The, there also was a 13th plane. And, uh, and I flew the 13th plane on two missions, on my 4th and 10th mission. And, uh, and, and I can show you uh, what, what I did on the on the missions, on those missions, we would drop pamphlets. We drop pamphlets. Let's see. Yeah. We have a wrong book. Anyway, we 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 drop pamphlets. Let's see, maybe it's in this one here. Yeah. Oh, this is the one. Okay, we drop pamphlets. It says, this is the end. It says, this is the end. Montgomery advances, and we on um, my uh, fourth mission we they, they these were little uh, packets, and my you know my radio operator he had special he would write on on the bombs messages for Hitler, and with chalk, and uh, and so when we had these pamphlets. He saw to it, I got these pamphlets. On my 10th mission, we dropped a German Stars and Stripes. And, uh, that's, and we, we pushed toward the end of the war. Okay, now you see this, this uh, chaff here, this is uh, uh, aluminum chaff, which was used, used to drop uh, 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 on bomb runs to jam their radar. So, so every plane, radio operator would drop this shaft on, on that three minute, uh, uh, three minute uh, to reach to reach the uh, to reach the, the bomb site and, and the bombing area.
Okay. Now, but and and I got then our crew, especially got trained, and uh, it, uh, our crew was especially trained for G bombing. Yeah, this is I, knew, I never knew anything about it. But what? Like here's the front lines, and and this is the Battle of the Bulge. This is where, where this happened. G bombing, you would have two radio stations on the front line. And and uh, there are circles around this. And G bombing, they would you would fly one of the circles and then, then you'd hack as you cross the other circles. And they call and uh, that was those bombs you could drop it within six hundred feet of accuracy. With G bombing, and uh, and so, and what happened on the Battle of the Bulge? There's about seven days they we tried the bomb in the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, the, there's the weather was terrible, and so they finally put the planes up. Well, they went up and and nobody dropped bombs but our bomb crew. And what happened was, 30 minutes before dropping the bombs, the Germans knocked out this station. So, we just had the one station. And we had a red hot navigator that says, I can do it with one, uh, with one station. And, and so they did. And, and uh, they, they were briefed to have a... Uh, uh, an 80 mile an hour headwind. So, so they, they, they did everything according to 80 mile an hour headwind. But actually, it was a 100 mile an hour headwind. Actually, when they dropped the bombs. And they dropped it two and a half miles short of the target. And dropped it on American troops. And so that, that's some of the things that happened on these missions that didn't go as planned. But that, so, so we, we were trained in jeep bomb, but we, we never were, we never used jeep bomb. We used radar droppings or visual. And as I told you, 80% of the missions that I flew were, were by radar scope. And there's some pictures of the radar scope in some of those books there. But uh, anyway, uh, what, what became interesting to, uh, on the, is that uh, they usually had three or four groups, uh, squadrons, three or four squadrons from one, one air base. And, uh, and there would be a lead pilot for each squadron. And I, and I was, uh, my crew was lead pilot on six missions, or and either lead pilot or deputy lead pilot. But anyway, the, the deputy lead would be be the one on the right up, up here. Did you prefer being one versus the other, like the lead pilot versus the deputy pilot? No, it didn't make any difference. I have to, yeah, it reminds me. That on my second mission, we went to Nuremberg, and there's a lot of contrails. You see, vapor trails, they were terrible on the on the on the uh, uh, Nuremberg mission. I went on. So three two squadrons, two groups, they made a, they made a 360 return. Our group then became the first airplanes over uh, Nuremberg. And I was flying in the number two airplane. I was flying right off the lead. And my co-pilot was uh, flying formation. He was, he, he was doing that at that time. And I, and I would look my head and there was, a, there was any aircraft burst. 50 feet in the head, right ahead of my nose. Eye level. 
Now, uh, any aircraft shells brush mushroomed up, so I knew that, that, that they, they they were there, but it had been uh, they could have been hidden under here if it was lower. See, but anyway, I saw that soul was bursting at eye level. 50 feet ahead of me, and so I watched and said, is it getting closer, or is it getting further, you know? And it so happened, they stayed right there, 50 feet in front of us. And so we dropped our bombs, and when you, you turn, uh, it turns off. Now, uh, you understand, most of my missions were 3,000 planes. But there are some missions where there were 4,000 planes, American planes, and these, we're talking about B-17s and B-24s. That flew all at the same time. They, they, uh, they'd go at the same time, but in a column. In other words, one bomb group followed another. Each bomb group was two, about three and a half minutes uh, after, after each other. So you'd find the column, stay in the column. And uh, you would change directions every two and a half minutes, two and a half degrees, uh, no, three degrees, three degrees every two and a half minutes. That's so you see an aircraft out here, an aircraft out there, because it, it takes a while for that shell to get up there. Now we flew the highest missions I flew at is at 32,000 feet. But uh, towards the end of the war, we were going, going, getting down to 20,000 feet, and some missions were 12,000 feet. Yeah. I'll tell you, there's, there's so much that happened, and it's hard to put it, tell you, tell you all this in an hour and a half's time. When you say fly formation, what is, what is that 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 mean? In other words? This is the formation, mm -hmm. and there is in that formation. There's 12 airplanes, okay. but you have the 13th plane is a scatter. Oh, yeah, he, it, what, see, he flies up the bomber column all by himself as fast as the plane can go, and he get 20 minutes at the bomb group ahead of, of the group, and so they would develop those pictures in that 20 minutes. And so they can debrief all the, all the, all the crews uh, when they got there. And as soon as you got off the plane, you went into the debriefing room and, uh, and they explained what happened on the mission. Well, man, I'll tell you, any, any, any questions? Uh, you know, I, I'm at a... Breaking point here where it changed. Surely you guys have some questions. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, the way I feel about it, I was sure proud. Oh, that, that's my, the jacket here is uh, it's the first thing you did to get. Oh, yeah, in England, you hire a tailor to, to, to uh, make this jacket for you. And that's the Eisenhower jacket. We did, we were not issued Eisenhower jackets, so we made them. And we want everybody to know we were hot pilots, so we had red line ones put in there. And. Uh, this is the wings here. I was the first lieutenant. The coloring is coming out of that. But the, I had I was awarded the Air Medal with two clusters right there. With it. But on. On May 8th, 1945, the war ended, and we had, uh, and it, but we really stopped bombing on April the 20th. 
there's a general named Patton that was running as fast as he could into Germany. And, uh, and then he would not tell Eisenhower where he was until 24 hours after he was there. And so we, on April the 20th, we bombed some, some Patton's troops because he did tell Eisenhower where he was. So Eisenhower says no more missions, no more B-17 missions. Now we loaded up to go on to another mission to bomb the, the, uh, the heavy water project in Norway. But we taxied up for takeoff, ran our engines, we sat out for 20 minutes. And Norway was an exceptionally floor, for a long mission for us. So they scrubbed the mission. And it's a good thing they did because we get all that information from Norway, heavy water project, by having troops sent there. Okay, let's see. Oh yeah, I have to tell you about Warner Goring. Laura, uh, we had a, a, a lead pilot named Warner Goring. He was a nephew of Herman Goring, the Luftwaffe chief. And, uh, and so, the, and what happened was he was recruited by the Mormons from Salt Lake City in Germany. And he was, his dad was recruited in Germany by these missionaries from, from the church. So in 1923, he came to Salt Lake City and and become an accountant for the Mormon Church. In the meantime, Herman Goring was born. And when you're born, you're an American citizen. But the, the, Air, but the Army Air Corps did not trust him. So they put a spy on his crew. And the spy was a co-pilot. They, de they demoted a first pilot and made him Werner Goring's co-pilot. And his instructions were he could not take a B-17 to England, I mean to Germany, because there'd be a big property in the thing. And so they put a spy on his crew, and he flew 25 missions, and he, in his flight boot, he carried a 45 on every mission. And of course, he never told the pilot ignoring that he was a spy or doing this. So after, after that, uh, 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 Werner came, went back to the States for 30 days and came back and became the lead pilot. And then I became the lead pilot. This, this, we were both really starters as lead pilots. And so uh, got well acquainted with him and then 2012, he wrote a book, and it's on that table there, uh, where he tells uh, his experiences uh, uh, with the uh, Army Air Corps and later the, the Army Air Force, the Air Force. And uh, he he became a lieutenant colonel uh, afterwards. And then there's another book over there. Is is written by an American B-17 pilot and a Luftwaffe pilot, and uh, he tells that there were 4,000 Luftwaffe pilots at the beginning of the war. End of the war is only 1,200 left, and the and uh, <coughs> the Germans were very unhappy. He was a he was a, a fighter pilot. He flew uh, ME. 109s and uh, and they every time he tells them he, he was a Luftwaffe pilot uh, that he says you lost the war for us because you didn't shoot down those B-17s and B-24s and uh, and it was so nasty he's living in uh, in Canada at uh, about, about, uh, Battle Parade I think it is. Or Victoria, one of the two. But uh, I have to show you 
these these were uh, cloth. These are maps were given to us, but uh, they didn't really mean too much to us. These of Europe, so you could walk out in, in Europe, walk out to, uh, through the French underground mainly, and, uh, and and they were very well made. But once once uh, since most of my missions were over Germany. Uh, uh, I did, we didn't carry him. Okay. There, I'm going to show you, look, this is an idiot stick. I flew one mission with this idiot stick as the lead pilot. And if that idiot stick is hooked directly to the autopilot, and they just, and, and it, even when you fly airlines today, they use an idiot stick very much similar to that, plus a steering wheel. But uh, that, but I just one mission. And this, just to show you that I'm a hot pilot, that the Air Force issued me sunglasses. And they even issued me officer's gloves. And this, these are the gloves I wore. And that, you understand, it will be 17. There was no heat, and uh, so we had an electric flying suit that we plugged in to keep warm. And sometimes they didn't work, but we were lucky most of the time. And usually on a mission, the mission lasts around eight to ten, eight to ten hours, and we, we would be served hot coffee and. Uh, a jug of coffee and uh, uh, roast beef sandwiches, and that was to hold us for that period of time. Now, I, being an officer, I could censor my own mail. You know, just write my name right there. This is this is the mail, and I always wrote letters to my parents. But I told my parents in a previous letter that whenever you get an email, you know that I'm alive that day. So after every mission, I would write them an email. Although it didn't reveal any confidential information, but they knew that I was alive and, and everything was going well. Now see, th this is the headset I wore on my missions. But uh, there's no microphone. We had throat mics that we had, and uh, the throat mics uh, would transfer, would work very well. You just you had a button on the steering wheel, and you just push the button, and, you, and the whole crew would hear you. Yeah, everybody was in their calm on, on a crew. One time, okay. The Berlin, I was on the last mission to Berlin, and uh, on that last mission, uh, a, uh, coming back, it was a very, very cool day, and and so uh, uh, we, here comes a B-17 to fly formation with us. And uh, and, we, and it was all painted up and looked nice, and like brand new, and but we didn't, didn't look like because the Eighth uh, Air Force planes were dirty because we had a lot of carbon and oil slicks on them, and so. But here comes a, a B twenty nine, B seventeen, comes up and flew formation with me after we had dropped the bombs. This is on the way back, and. And we thought it was rather strange, you know. It had a yellow tail with an H on it, no, which is the marking of one of their bomb groups. And uh, and he flew there for about for about 20 minutes. And uh, and we had, we were no longer had any fire protection. And so uh, uh, my crew and the, all the crews in in the, in the 
squadron, 23rd guns at, at this plane. And uh, instructions I gave the crew is if a, that ball turn ever points his guns, that's just shoot. Well, uh, so this to show you how close they were to me, we could see their German helmets. You know that German helmets have a little uh, notch in them, and we could see they were that close to us. But uh, they had a full crew, and all, they had, all the stations were around it. But then uh, after 20 minutes, uh, here comes a thunderhead along, and he peels off. That's the last we saw him. But this is on the Berlin Raid, and, and uh, it's getting close to the end of the war. We just think they were just cruising, doing something. And, uh, okay. Another thing on the table. Oh, see now, I became, I, I'm a, I'm a first lieutenant in the Air Force, and that's my uniform. But that's all I got of it. I, did, I never bought a full dress uniform. Uh, Let's see, I'll just want to... Oh, the ME2, uh, see those three instruments there? On the, the yeah. those three there. Those are instruments out of an ME262. And the ME262 was a German jet, yeah. One of them is an altimeter, one of them is a G meter, and one of them is a local, is a, a uh, Landing localizer. That, that's the landing localizer coming in for landing on the ground. And, uh, and, the, and that's, the, I think it's a G meter altimeter, is one, of, one of the two. Yeah, that's, and what happened was we went to, uh, after the Hells Angel bomb group broke up, which is about 60 days, six days after the end of World War uh, in Europe. Uh, I got sent to Bury City, St. Edmunds Airfield, 94th bomb group. And, and when I got there, I should flip that over there and show, uh, look at the, oh, leave it there. <laughs> there and I got a brand new B-17 that never had a mission. And it's a good looking girl on there and it says, just once more. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, but uh, I'll, the thing is that uh, about, about the uh, where he said Edmund, the, uh, the uh, ordinance officer says, we got a bunch of bombs here we want to get rid of. So, I, well, he picked out and says, oh, these six planes, six crews, get rid of these bombs out of, out of it. Well, so we, they load them up and we went out to the North Sea and, and dumped them. But the, what we didn't, what he didn't anticipate is we dropped them all the 25 feet. We skipped bombing. <laughs> and one of the bombs that skipped and hit the tail, hit, knocked one of these rudders off. On these elevators, on. but uh, that was the last time we did that. <laughs> Another thing that I did at Birds Head Edmund is I, they had me and three of us, three crews, drop Disney bombs, and the Disney bombs weighed four thousand five hundred pounds each, so we carried one bomb under each wing, and we dropped them on uh, concrete. Uh, rebutments uh, uh, the sea with, if they would go off. These are Disney bombs that had stainless steel heads and seven rockets in the tail. And they were to knock out underground factories. Underground factories. In other words, it would penetrate earth 50 feet or 15 feet of concrete. And, and so uh, we uh, went on uh, uh, three missions, and it so happens on the third mission, it got clouded over, but it, it, we also got reports back that uh, one of the bombs, the, 
the rockets did not go off. One of the rockets, one of the seven, didn't go off, and it veered off course, and it went through a schoolhouse. And so, and then we dropped them without any rockets. But they had stainless steel heads, and they were specifically designed to knock out underground factories. And then, you know, we had the Iran people talking about the nuclear bombs knocking them out. We had, we had the uh, know-how to do that at, at the end of World War II. And these were, Disney bombs were designed by the British uh, Experimental Organization. Now, well, let's see, how long have I talked? One hour. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Uh, so, can you describe kind of like what you thought, or like what was going through your mind whenever like the bombs were dropped on Japan? No, this is Germany. Yeah. But did you have like, would they have told you that even while you were in Europe, or? Oh, the thing is, you know, when you're 20 year your age, you, you know, you try anything, and we did, we didn't have much fear, and the thing we were so well trained that we the, the, a lot of the fear was taken away from us, and uh, and and the thing is, we when do you hear them talking today about carpet bombing? We carpet bomb. In other words, the bombs would come out every, say, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. So they would be, you know, you get a big area covered. And another thing, too, is they always said that uh, we were hitting marshalling yards. Well, the reason for that is the marshalling yards are in the center of the city, and so. Uh, we were legitimate in dropping the bombs in the center of the city. Now, the the thing that I got involved in, in my first ten missions is is the railroads. They they, they uh, the Germans were keeping their repair crews in big cities. Well, we so we start bombing little towns like St. John or any other small town. So they have to correct the railroad in St. John if they can go to, to Dodge City, you know, or any of the other towns. And so it worked. Yeah, that was well designed. And then the next thing we went to is, is uh, ME-262 German jet, uh, German jet plant, uh, airports. And, uh, and I don't know. The, the thing is, Hitler made a mistake, or Goering, Goering made the mistake of not using those jets. Okay, now, uh, the thing, another thing that, that was developed in, in uh, Europe, you see the chin, it has chin turrets there. So that makes, uh, they added two more machine guns in the front. That's caused the Focke-Wolf 190s had 20 millimeter shells in, 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 and they'd come in from the front and knock out B-17s. So all of the planes in Europe got chin turrets. And, uh, and, and the FW-190s uh, stopped doing it. And, and uh, it's just, uh, we were very flexible. In other words, we tried anything. We had glide bombs. They tried on Frankfurt, and our woman was in on that. But the, the, they was not very, very accurate at all. Fly bombs, and they couldn't control that. How did you keep um, up to date on the information of what was going on around the world? Other oh no, no we didn't. You really didn't. Yeah, we get the stars and stripes, American stars and stripes. Uh, that we, we would get some information that way. Yeah, but the, but uh, it just uh, I, I remember it was uh, VE Day, 
when the war ended in Europe. I was told by, by an officer that we had a bomb that's a hundred times more powerful than any bomb that, that has been made. And, well, you know, it just uh, scuttled up. But anyway, that was before they even dropped the bomb, uh, the atomic bomb. That's before they even tested it. But they knew that, that this was going to happen. So we did, there, there are some, uh, some uh, uh, talk about things going on. And uh, they, they're just, they're, there's so much that <laughs> going on. I can't, can't remember all of it, but uh, uh, let's see, there's one thing about how this I mentioned. Uh, hell, I can't think of it right now. But Were the, you still in Normandy when the war was over, when they declared the war over? Were you the, were still flying in Normandy? Well, we, the Normandy, of course, uh, uh, Normandy was June 6th. That's when they invaded. They were, you know, they were uh, moving. They moved pretty good. The army had been pretty good, and push Hitler back. The thing, the thing that I, that I happened to me was, after I stayed in the reserve. Well, I'll tell you, but, but maybe now I want to tell you about Munich, because I only got I had 16 missions. They decided that I didn't have enough points to go home, so I got shipped to Munich. And uh, they had no assignment for me in Munich. But they, they, we, they took uh, 10 C 47s and flew all the soldiers that, from the bomb groups of, of, in England to, uh, Munich, uh, to Munich or Frankfurt or other bases. Well, and in the meantime, that is there that picture there? Is there a boy on there? Saying that? Yeah. Yeah. He got killed. You know, um, or they got transferred. They, the, the one of the ten, one of the C forty sevens flew into a, a, a mountain at Frankfurt, and uh, everybody aboard that was killed. But the rest of us, we were still back in London, and we didn't go on that flight. And then, then I, but I finally got shipped to Munich. I had no assignment. I, I first had a jeep with unlimited gas and, and uh, German automobiles and, and motorcycles I could ride. And uh, boy, and we, oh, I got pictures here where I visit Hitler's crow's nest within two weeks in two weeks after the war. And uh, and so so we, 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 had, we had a lot of free time. And so I went to Switzerland and I went to, to uh, Italy. I became a, a, a C-47 co-pilot. And, uh, and, and I, being a first pilot, and it, it kind of hurt my pride, so I decided not to do that anymore. But uh, then I finally, but the thing is, they took my Jeep away from me, my gas away from me, and so I took, asked for a job. Mm -hmm. And I became a booking officer of all the military flights on the meeting. And the, the thing about it is that all of it, anybody, that the military allowed could fly on our C 47s on Mini to Frankfurt and Berlin mainly, in the main places you know. I would have German civilians would come in with maps and say, Can we see the Americans uh, about this? Because I think I got some better uh, diesel engines than what, they, what we had. And so I would. Uh, put them on, you know, give them a, uh, they would get a uh, fly to Frankfurt with their maps, 
and show them to the American forces. And of course, what happened after that, I, I don't know. We also had trouble with the Russians at that time. The Russians were would had uniform Hungarian officers or Bulgarian officers or Czechoslovakian officers who would come in on our airlines community and had sidearms on. And my instructions were that don't give these guys a hard time and they'd shoot you. And, uh, and so I would, and my instructions were to book them to the Excelsior Hotel, right close to where my office was. And the, the Excelsior rooms were bugged. And uh, they were recruiting Luftwaffe pilots from, uh, right under our noses, and we knew it. And, and so uh, that's, that was our, and, and, and to me, these were stupid officers, <laughs> investigators or whatever they were, agents, because they would, they had the camera take pictures of my flight schedule or they would write it in a little book right in front of me and right over my head. But we, we put up with that until I left. But the, the events they got better, don't do it, kid yourself, the Russians are, are plenty smart. But, uh, uh, all right. So you came back to the States. Came back to the States, went to law school. Went to law school. And, and my, all my law school expenses were paid for under the GI Bill. And you got 99, 48 months, but I got 50 months paid. And because it was part of the semester. And uh, I still stayed in the reserve. And I was in the reserves in, in the, uh, the 442nd Troop Carrier Wing, which was the same unit that I was assigned to in, in Munich. And, uh, and so I, I flew C-46s and C-47s and the AT-11s and the AT-17s. And, and, uh, and, and so I got, oh, I have two snap glider takeoffs in, in my reserve training. Two snap glider. In other words, a C-47 flies over to you, and you have a chain hook there, and they hook it, and you take off and land. There's a picture of the, one of the places there. Uh, and did I read that you went to Topeka and got two? Yes, I flew. I got to fly in a C-47, uh, B-17. And the thing about it is, the B-17 I flew in, you know, I told you about that little round hole where the, we saw that engine fire. Well, the latest B-17 they manufactured covered it up. Oh, that's and and. Uh, you wonder if it sometimes these improvements. Now the B, the B twenty five, B twenty nine. You know that that was Tibbets got his training here at Pratt Air Base, and uh, they had many modifications. Now she's looking at the maps that my navigator drew of the missions. Uh, the, uh, they, uh, he drew those. My navigator. She, he, and then he gave them to me after the mission. Yeah. And then you did, where'd you meet your wife at? I uh, met her at KU. Mm. You She's know. a Jayhawk. Huh? She's a Jayhawk. <laughs> Ryan is in the reserves, aren't you, Ryan? Yeah. He's, he's I'm in the National Guard. Yeah, uh, high school. Army National Guard. My my son teaches at Wyandot, no Washington School in Wyandot County, and he says his best students are his ROTC students, and they come one day a week in uniform. Do you come one day a week in uniform? Uh, I'm not ROTC. Oh, hey. I'm uh, Army National Guard. 
Army and I sleep together. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. But, uh, let's see. Something else I saw. Oh, uh, the, the, these are the things you would wear, and when you meet the Russians, you'd have, you'd have wear those armbands with uh, the flags on. And the Queen Elizabeth came. She was a princess, I think, then, and she came visit the base. And we, we were Bob Hope. Now that picture there, you look at you. Okay, the one thing our commanding officer did on the day after. Uh, VE Day, he says, these ground men have been there three and a half years and never got to go home or, or, or go on leave. And so he says, I want every man, every ground man to go, get, go, go aboard a B-17 and fly over the earth. And that's the that's pictures that were taken uh, of the uh, uh, the places we visited. Then on the left here you see uh, the I itinerary where, where we went to. Uh, that, that picture you're seeing there, that's a briefing sheet of who flies the mission. I, I don't know what mission that, that, that is on. Did you but, lose many men? Huh? Did you lose many men in your? Not too many. Not too many, not too many towards the end. No. No. There's that scurry St. St. Edmunds, the 94th bomb group was there, and you took off and landed uh, uh, on the east side of that, to the right of that. That, now that on the area of thumb is that's the barracks that I lived in, which was a hospital ship, uh, a hospital building there at Haar, Germany, outside of Munich, and you could see they had gas masks for all the rooms. Have you been back? To um, yes, yes, been? only. I have to tell you. Now it reminds me of another thing. Let me tell you about. My last mission was Shastad Airfield, and it was a clear day. And and uh, and so uh, we went. This was our last mission, and so we dropped through bombs at Shastad Airfield, and my crew says our bombs were in down the runway. And I could hear them yelling, "Yeah, yeah!" How we hit that air? Oh boy, we were in. We were there was some any aircraft, but. Uh, but they never, you know, I don't think we had a hole in the hole coming back. But uh, uh, in 1976, I went on a people and people tour of attorneys to meeting. And, and they, of course, they, uh, we had a little booklet to went out what we did in the war and so forth. So it was known that I was a B-17 pilot, and uh, and so in, during that ceremony, we're meeting with the attorneys of Munich. They made a presentation to me by this, the gun, the officer in charge of the gun, six guns at Shastad Airfield, and uh, he was not married, and he. And he's say, about six foot six tall. I, I could just see him in his boots. Those are just local pictures that my dad collected. My dad was a collector. Thank goodness I have one of this. Do kids have any Oh, okay. Well, let me tell you this, this story right here. See that there? That's the officers at, uh, in Munich. Okay. We had uh, a, a singer there, and she'd get drunk every night. And, and why? Because when she was in France, with her husband, some German soldiers came and, and beat and killed her husband in front of her and broke all his bones in his body. 
and then she got sent to the doctor's hospital so they could, uh, and they were testing whether she could get pregnant with it from dogs. Now, that, that's how gross things were. And, and the, that's the reason she's getting drunk every night, because uh, she went through that. Now, there's a bomb strikes there. There's some more maps. There's the paper. Oh, the thing about, about Munich was, Goring showed off his airfield, uh, his Air Force in, in Munich in 1938, and they had a stadium around the side, besides the buildings. And, uh, and he was showing off the Luftwaffe Air Force at that time, and of course he was a big hero then. But, uh, but the, the, these are things that the Germany went through, and uh, there's no question about it. We had to pay a, a dear price for those. Do you think patriotism is as strong today? No. 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 The fact is, I wonder now what I was fighting for. Because we really believe in, in, in our government, we believe in our leaders, you know, and we fought for our leaders, and we were proud of our leaders. And it's a well-deserved uh, organization, you know, that we had. Oh, okay. I went to KU and I was in the reserve and I got my spending money I got from the Air Force for as a weekend warrior. So I make about $100 a month and that was for my gas and for my pleasure while going to school. So it didn't cost me anything uh, to go, go through college because everything was paid for. And there, uh, while I was at, I was in the reserve, I learned to fly these various planes, you know. And it, it, there's a picture of me flying a, a C-82, which is a, uh, 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 they call it a flying boxcar. Mm -hmm. They were C 119s, where it was a better, better version. But it, uh, but uh, while I was at uh, my unit, while I was there at KU, my unit got called, the 442nd Troop Carrying Unit got called to London for the Korean War. I had six months left. To do, you know, graduate from law school, I asked for a deferment and got it. Right, and the rest of my friends had to go, had to go to London. And I had a, um, like a great uncle that fought in that war. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so on my last, my last flight with the reserve, and before they left, I, I flew. Uh, a uh, C-17, C and it's a, a beach craft airplane, twin engine beach with twin tails on it. And, it, and, uh, <coughs> and about four, and I had a co-pilot with me, about, and so at about four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, we flew about an hour, hour and a half, and then we go in. As we were going in to land, the control tower tells us, there's something wrong with one of your landing gears because it's flopping. And we couldn't see it. We couldn't see it flopping from the, from the pilot's compartment. And uh, so, so they got the operations officer up here. And he says, well, my instruction to see you is that you fly until you get down to about 10 gallons of gas in each tank and uh, land. Well, that, that's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. 
I had to fly it clear when it passed dark. There was a halfway down the runway was a GCA unit, a, a thing, instrument landing, and they said, "Be sure you land that first half of the runway because we don't want you not the GCA unit out sitting there." On the, sitting on the side of the runway. Well, when it comes to the land and after, I, we, I said the Lord's Prayer 20 times or so. You know, I went in the land and, uh, and I landed on the one wheel. And, uh, and so uh, finally this wing dropped down, lack of airspeed, of course. So I hit the brake on the other wheel, and it collapsed it. So they made it a belly landing. It s off the runway. And uh, and so my, my co-pilot and I, we, we didn't walk away from the landing. We ran away from it. But that's not, the worst part was I about, just about got killed. Because here comes the fire trucks, 70 mile an hour at night. And, uh, you know, it'd be, be tall things, you know. And I had to jump out of the way of that, that fire truck to save my life. So, then the next day, the FBI, well, I had to take a confidence ride the next day. That's the rule of the Air Force. You had a cr crash, you let you fly the next day. And uh, so I flew the next day. But uh, the. Why is that the rule? Just say. Get confidence. I mean, after all, they spend a million dollars on you. Yeah. They don't want to lose you. And they, they, and they have the same same uh, attitude to you with them. And and so uh, we, we survived. And the unit went to London and and uh, a, uh, this uh, attorney friend of mine was on the runway and uh, two uh, Navy planes crashed over him, spilled gasoline on him and fire. And then the Air Force discharged him. Yeah, that, that picture of the boys looking there right now is Eats. That was the off my office, in front of my office in on Ludwigstrasse. And uh, every noon, I'd you'd walk three blocks to Hitler's art gallery, maybe there's a picture of that there. And, uh, and we'd have dinner there, and uh, the buildings I walked by would smell. There were people there, still smell. So it, it's kind of hard in the appetite when you yeah. had that. Everything. So your father kept scrapbooks? Yep. And your mom kept your letters? Yeah, my, my dad, my dad. See, so, yeah. The, after every mission, I wrote, wrote uh, email so my folks would have it and they'd know I was alive. Did you kids want to kind of walk around and look at some of the... There's, the, the, there's some of the books of uh, my flight training and and the thing was, I was supposed to go to Lemoore, Colorado to fly B-25s and didn't get to go. And uh, probably the blessing I'd be the Pacific instead of the Europe because the, the war in Europe was over with. 